Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for you have given us the assurance that you will always be with us and that your grace is sufficient, sufficient to all our needs. Thank you so much for your goodness and your faithfulness to your people. In Jesus' name, Amen. I had a conversation with my son and he asked me a question, Dad, is the world going to end? And I said, not yet. And I was about to um, as well follow it up with a statement, I still need to see my grandkids. <laughs> if you knew um, Ravi Zacharias, uh, the one who he discipled, his name is Na, Nabil Khorizi. He just died also of cancer. He's been really instrumental in bringing that kind of presentation that all people who are in the scientific kind of perspective trying to totally ignore and uh, argue that there is no God. He's been instrumental in engaging that kind of conversation because he, his um, cultural orientation is that he is a devout uh, Muslim and he came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, been under Ravi Zacharias ministry for a long time and he just passed away last week. <clears throat> when we are also going to look at everything that's going on in the world, we feel like the end times really just on the near future. It's, it's feeling like it's going to be happening probably tomorrow. And when I also try to search from the scriptures, the Bible tells us that and has given us this um, encouragement. Do not be alarmed. These things are going to happen. Um, you will hear wars and rumors of wars and calamities all over the world. But this is just like the beginning. Um, because when the end of the world will come, it means to say that everybody has heard the gospel. And it's so scary because when you say hear the gospel, they will see it, they will hear the gospel being proclaimed and the way it has been presented is no longer that kind of um, experience that we had in the past wherein we were thinking of the gospel being brought and being shared and preached by missionaries. Now it's on a different horizon. Now it's in the different realms. Now we see the gospel being preached on the Facebook, social media, um, everything. Um, you can find internet at the top of Mount Timbuktu. It's just amazing. It's been expedited. It's been fast forwarded in a way wherein we are so amazed how, how this explosion of knowledge has given us so much in life but at the same time the spiritual ramification of it is that the gospel has been preached and has been heard. And any time from now the end could come. Any time. And when I see the parallelism of these things going on in our society today, in our time, with what the scripture um, is telling us, I'm all the more inspired and assured that the word of God is indeed true and it will come to pass everything that God has said, everything will happen and everything will come true. So I entitled this message today in light of what's going on in our time, in light of what we have been facing personally um, as a church, as a family of believers. I entitled it um, the Spiritual Marathon. Spiritual Marathon. Um, if you remember Marathon, um, it's about 490 BC. The 
uh, word, the origin of the word marathon um, started because of this PD, PD Pides um, who ran 25 um, kilometers um, and announcing to Athens the defeat of the Persians. So that was like 490 BC, about between August to September. So it's just like fitting today that it's like almost the end of the September the spiritual marathon. And there is no other um, sport that I could probably draw um, any parallelism on the spiritual things that I would like to share with you because I cannot use boxing because it was not a sanctioned sport in, in the New Testament. You cannot use any other um, sports that we are familiar with, football or basketball, uh, only marathon because the Bible uses the word, let us run the race. So racing was a popular sport in the time of the disciples. And this is where we would like to draw this parallel spiritual truth that I would like to share. So spiritual marathon and there are three things that I would like to share, main points that we'll cover on the things that we would be um, having from the Word of God today. The first point is inspiration. When we think about spiritual marathon, we need to have an inspiration. Anyone who would like to be in sports, you need to have an inspiration. It could come from um, a lot of things. You are inspired because of your grandma. You are inspired because of somebody that you are very close to. You are inspired because of that model and that kind of sport icon that you'd like to follow. That's inspiration. And I, the second thing about being inspired is that you will not become an athlete or a racer if you are just inspired and you are not disciplined. Okay. So after being inspired, then we grow from being inspired to being disciplined. Now you go to the gym, you uh, do all the curls, you run, you exercise every morning, you improve your cardiovascular, you improve your muscle dis definition, you improve your, your persistence and perseverance when it comes to running or whatever sport you will be. Now, once you... You and I are already in that stage wherein we are disciplined, we are ready, and we've been engaging in, in all of those races or competitions. To sustain it is another level. So we have inspiration, we have discipline, and again, we need to have another inspiration. So inspiration, discipline, inspiration. Because a lot of athletes, if you are going to, to, to see what's going on in our world today, they, they've been inspired, they've been disciplined, and you see Tiger Woods hitting the ball 300 yards, more than 300 yards, and he conquered being number one for 485 weeks all over the world. And then from there, he lost his inspiration, he had the discipline, and he needed another inspiration. Because it is easy to become number one, and it is hard to maintain being number one. It is easy for us to be inspired with the preaching and the word of the Lord. It is a little bit harder for us to go through the process of discipline but after that, we are facing and we are conquering. We overcome our hurdles and everything in life to maintain in that level and to grow consistently in the grace of God. We need another inspiration. You see, Tiger Woods, like, you know, going down and I don't know what's going on. We see so many athletes, Mayweather saying, I don't have anything to prove. Michael Jordan, how many times that he, you know, um, retired and then come back because he found another inspiration and come back and then retired once again to maintain in that level and to really keep the fire burning in our spiritual marathon. 
is something. So I would like to speak briefly on all those main points. Probably some of you will be asking, you know, pastor is giving a different kind of presentation today because I gave the title and I gave the main points. And then after that, let's do it in a closing prayer. Let's all close. <laughs> So if you have your Bibles with you, please open it with me to Hebrews. I gave, I gave, this, uh, um, I, I gave this joke like a long time ago, but for the benefit of those who were not here, the, you know that men are supposed to prepare coffee, right? Yeah. So, because Hebrews, from the book of Hebrews. Okay, <laughs> Hebrews um, 12. <clears throat> Okay, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us show, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race mark out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you must have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when, you, when he rebuke, rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So it is very, very clear here that when it comes to the spiritual experience in our spiritual life, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Moses is there, Abraham is there, Elijah's there, Bob's there, <laughs> cheering for us. It's like a heavenly stadium, and we are right running this race. The thing about this race, before I will go deeper into the <clears throat> main points that I just shared to you, is that this is the kind of race that you don't compete with one another. <laughs> This is an individual race. I would probably try to organize an association wherein you got prizes when you beat yourself and, and you have your personal record. Somebody probably, you will remind that they broke that 100 uh, meter uh, um, race within nine point something seconds. And then somebody will run beating the, her, his or her personal record for 25 seconds or 30 seconds. You say, hey, this is your prize. You beat your own record. A spiritual marathon is an individual race. This is your race with faith and your walk with God, if you may also describe some of those moments wherein you just have to walk. Sometimes you s stop running, but you must walk in order to persevere in the faith. This is also the kind of race wherein the Bible is giving us the picture of the many men of faith, women of faith who were ahead of us, cheering us and inspiring us. It is hard to imagine that this is what's going on in the heavenly realms, but the Bible is so clear. Therefore, as we are surrounded by such cloud of witnesses, we are inspired and inspired before we got to our own inspiration. God has been throwing inspirations all over the place in all aspects of life, in all things that we do from day to day. God has been throwing inspirations. 
before there is that inspiration from within that has been generated with all of those expressions of love, with all of those expressions and provisions and all those interventions, heavenly connections, God has been inspiring us and now is the moment we're in. We, by the grace of God, unknowingly, that, that inspiration generated from within and the Bible tells us, verse 2, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us fix. So from everything and all the experiences that we have in life, the inspiration that must be generated from within is that because of Jesus. Why do we continue to serve? Why do we have inspiration? Why are we drawn towards Christianity? Why are we drawn towards the grace of God? The Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus. And everything that we do and everything that has been going on, the only inspiration that I would like us to cultivate and to be inspired on and, and to generate that inward longing inspiration from day to day to live, to fight, to struggle, it must be because of Jesus. Because if we are doing something in our spiritual life apart from Jesus, we will easily fall. Pastors fall. Members also have fallen. You remember the time of Jimmy Swaggart, Evangelist Baker, and all of those who had been in the faith, and when they fell, imagine thousands of believers who had also fallen and they lost their inspiration because their eyes were not fixed on Jesus. It is amazing because the Bible, the book of Hebrews, used the word, fix your eyes upon Jesus. And it's so hard to really make sense of that statement because you cannot see Jesus. And, and some probably would say, you don't see Jesus, but Jesus is in me. And people will also respond, if, I, if you say Jesus is in you, I don't really see Jesus behaving in your life. So it's so hard to really make sense of the word, fix your eyes upon Jesus. But it's so amazing because prior to that, and also the succeeding statement, fix your eyes upon Jesus, the description of Jesus is this, the author and the finisher of our faith. You see, fix your eyes upon Jesus to make sense of that statement is that Jesus is the author of faith. And the finisher of our faith. You see, how it transcends from the whole concept we're in generally. See, I'm so, I'm so inspired here. Generally, Jesus has been described as the author of faith. The author of faith. And then the second part of that is Jesus now becoming the finisher of my faith. You see, from the general perspective to a personal one, that Jesus is the author of faith, and now, because of that inspiration, Jesus has become the finisher of my faith. That's the inspiration there. Now, that inspiration did not just come from, from, from a, an oblivious or whatever unknown source. Read back chapter 11. Chapter 11 will tell us that kind of faith. If you have your Bibles with you, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what, we, what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By, by faith, Abel offered God. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Noah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Abraham, 
all of these were still living by faith when they died. And on fast forward to chapter 12, Jesus is the author of faith. And if you are to connect all those dots together, if Jesus is the author of faith mentioned in chapter 12, and faith was mentioned here specifically in verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, we can draw a conclusion that Jesus is the creator and has been there before the foundation of the world. Because Jesus is the author of faith. Which means to say that if you fix, and I will fix my eyes upon Jesus, the author of faith. Meaning to say that I have someone that I am inspired of. Who has a heavenly track record of being present in the past. And in the distant past. And in the distant past before the creation. He has this track record who, of being omniscient, of being omnipresent, of being omnipotent God. You can never, never be lacking of anything if Jesus is our inspiration. Because Jesus is God. That's why the book of Hebrews, if you are going to look at it intently, you will find an amazing revelation of who Jesus is, that he was not just that God man crucified in the cross of Calvary. He is God and the author of faith. And how it translated from being the author of faith to the finisher of my faith is just amazing. That the God of whom everything in this world that we can see were created. Of whom those witnesses in the heavenly realms cheering for us. Enoch is cheering for us. Moses, Abraham is cheering for us. It's the same God who takes pleasure in knowing someone who is sitting in the few in a very small church in Nipomo, California. And say, I want to be the finisher of your faith. Just imagine that. Just, just marvelous. Just wonderful. It's just amazing. Just amazing as what we have sung a while ago. Just amazing. It's just beautiful. Just so sweet. And so when I look at the multiple loss that I've had for this week, when I remember Bob, I was like, wow, just wow, and just wow, and tears were falling, but there is that comfort from within knowing that my inspiration is Jesus. So after that inspiration that we have in Christ, Jesus, it's amazing to see how it transition, it transition here. From very the perfecter of faith, who for joy said before him, endured the cross. See the transition there? From glory to the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. My inspiration is the one who is now giving me an inspiration how to discipline myself. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart in your struggle against sin. See, the Bible talks about struggle against sin. Because I believe that not one of us will be coming out from, from this worship service who will be living a saintly life that you will never sin for the whole week. <laughs> we struggle against sin but we are no longer living in sin so there is a difference christian uh, a question was given to me a very um uh, simple question and yet very profound in the way you should understand the question because uh, pastor can christians still commit sin um there's a very simple question but profoundly to respond to it in a way where in the scripture is telling us those who are in christ jesus will no longer, First John chapter 4 and chapter 5, will no longer live in sin. 
we may commit sin, but we are not happy committing that sin. That's why we confess all our sins. Jesus is faithful in just to forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So we struggle against sin. Amen to that. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. You did not die. And you have forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My sons, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So we are seeing the struggle against sin. And then we are struggling. We are now hearing from the book of Hebrews, the, from the writer of the book of Hebrews saying, don't disregard and take light the disciplines that God is allowing you to have in your own walk. Because God disciplines whom he loves. Struggles, sin, discipline, and a loving relationship. What does this picture will tell us? The picture will give us a reality of what a Christian life is all about. This is the reason why I would disclose as well that I am not into this prosperity gospel. Not prosperity gospel. God is going to prosper us. But this pros prosperity gospel wherein you have to really do this and do that and obey this because God is going to reward you and bless you. I say amen to that, but that's not the whole picture of what Christian life is all about. Christian life is about struggle, about reality, about what you are facing, what you have on your plate. It's about overcoming and using that opportunity to grow in your spiritual life. And it talks about here discipline. The Lord will allow us to go through discipline in life. And this discipline could be in a, in a picture and a manifestation of circumstances beyond our control. People who are so pesky uh, that we deal de with from day to day. People who are annoying. People who have different, our co-workers, the way we drive, the way we interact with strangers that, who will cut just, you know, from nowhere. These are those opportunities we're in Generally speaking, God said, don't despise the discipline. Now, it is also not a good thing if someone will come to you and say, I am struggling with what's going on in my life. And you respond right away. God is disciplining you, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Why? Because the loving relationship is not there as well. And we cannot judge somebody's struggle in the way we understand that the scripture is, 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 is providing us with the information that this is the way Christian life should be. We were called to be kind to one another. And so the ministry of empathy must be there. I, I, had, I had the blessing of mentoring pastors for this past few weeks and visiting patients. And it's I've been so inspired to also pass on the ministry of empathy because when we visited one patient, the patient was coherent and the patient responded saying, I hate being alive. I want to die. So how would we respond to that? And, and typically, as a pastor, I remember if I was that young pastor then, I would say, no, no, you should be alive. <laughs> you should be inspired. And when I responded saying, it sounds to me that you have lost the will and the inspiration to live what's going on. And she started to dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And in open, it opened up with a conversation that was transitioning towards the meaning of life. And after the visit, that pastor told me, Pastor Romy, thank you very much because I have seen that as a pastor, when it comes to providing that kind of interaction and ministry, um, now I realize that there is always a growing opportunity for all pastors to have this kind of ministry of empathy. 
And I'm sharing this to you because you will be encountering people like that who will come to you and say, I don't want to live anymore. And then some of us might probably respond by saying, just take a shower, girl. <laughs> just take a shower. <laughs> You'll be fine. You're gorgeous. Look at you. You have a very nice job. Your husband is so amazing. You will be fine. No. We respond in a way wherein we understand that the Christian life is about being disciplined spiritually. And so you now treat everything that's in your plate as an opportunity to be refined, to be transformed, and to grow more and more glory to glory from day to day. We, we grow into the knowledge of Christ. We grow towards Christ's likeness. We are not inspired only to, be, to see Jesus as the author of faith in the finish of our faith. We are not inspired, but we are now being disciplined to be like Him. It's one thing to be inspired. It's another thing to be transformed to be like Him. This is the reason why there is discipline. Read the succeeding verses. We are disciplined towards this opportunity and the blessing of growing into His likeness, into holiness. Be inspired by Jesus. Amen. But at the same time, God is working tremendously, miraculously in and through your life that all of those incidents and, and I would say accidents and circumstances happening in your life, they are not accidents. Actually, God has allowed those things happening in our lives for us to be transformed, to, to be shaped and, and to conform to the likeness of Jesus Christ, who is in the first place our inspiration. And I'm growing to be like him. I'm growing to be like him. I, I mentioned in the many messages that I had that um, it, Tiger Woods was just my inspiration. In fact, I, I try to be like him, but honestly, <laughs> realistically, I cannot be just even 25% to be like Tiger Woods. I probably hit um, my drive 300 plus few occasions and there was no Facebook at the time I should have that Facebook uh, account back then so that I have a moment to celebrate from day to day when I will be growing old but this is it the one that we are so inspired his name is Jesus he has given us everything in life to conform in his image and to conform to be like him that despite the struggle of sin, that despite our failures and our short-sightedness and our weaknesses, Jesus is saying, you are still growing to be like me. You are still growing to be like me. Verse 10, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful later on. However, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Verse 7, endure discipline as, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Verse 12, therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. This is talking about again the, the, the cycle of being a blessing, verse 12, being a blessing to those who are looking and following and within our network of relationships. The last inspiration, inspiration, discipline, and inspiration is that if you are going to look from chapter 12 all the way to chapter 13, this looks forward to the grand reunion in heaven. The reason why in the very beginning of verse 1, there is a cloud of witnesses cheering for us. 
because someday, someday, we will also be joining with those cloud of witnesses. This is another level of inspiration. If you will be given the chance in this lifetime, who would you be dreaming to have or to sit down with you and eat in a six or diamond level or star restaurant or a dining place in the whole world? Who would it be? Anyone? Jan Crouch. Okay, Jan Crouch. Yes, yay. Okay. <laughs> Please participate, okay? I want to know if you are a follower of Vilma Santos or... No, Vilma Santos is the local Filipino TV. <laughs> All right. Who else? Who would it be? Anyone? Aside from Jesus, I mean, the, the personality that you adore, the personality that you have been inspired of growing up. We have one. Anyone? I would say me, Billy Graham, <laughs> for me. Anyone else? My grandmother. Oh, grandmother. Who else? Who? Father. Your father? Donald Trump? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who else? <laughs> he will pick up the tab. Who else? Who else? Yeah. Who else? My son. Your son? Anyone? Mrs. Smith? Who would, who would you dream of joining in the table? My father. Your father. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Armstrong. Mr. Armstrong. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I would love that, right? Yeah. Just imagine that you will be seated with Abraham and Moses in the heavenly realms and would probably have the chance to ask anything about how realistic Abraham's faith was. These were like the icons of faith and the inspiration that we have as we go through discipline, fixing our eyes upon Jesus, is that we will be together with the people that we love the most and spend and spend eternity with them spend eternity with them how cool is that let us pray almighty god we just amazing 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 love Amazing inspiration of who Jesus is. And continue to be with us. Continue to set our hearts on fire in Jesus' most beautiful, sweetest name of all. Amen. And all these people say amen. <clears throat>